Hey guys, welcome to M&A Business Integrations. In this video, we're going to give you an overview and an introduction to post-merger integrations. So essentially, let's start off with what is an integration and then we'll go through basically some learnings from a very large day one integration that I went through um, and kind of next then going through kind of what the applicable lessons from that are and then going through some practical examples and then we'll kind of conclude the video but first of all let's discuss what is an integration well integration is a really interesting topic because it's a really complex area but it's also incredibly simplistic it's simplistic in the sense that it's very easy to describe what it is. And this diagram visualizes it. You're essentially bringing together two companies and that's kind of step one and step two. It could even be more than that. It could be, could be like three companies or very rarely like even more than that. But for most of the time, you're bringing together two companies, typically large companies. Um, but it could also be one larger company absorbing a smaller one. Um, but I, I tend to think of that more as an acquisition rather than a merger. When we say the words merger, um, it's really bringing together two companies of similar sizes. And there's a lot of issues with that as opposed to doing one larger company acquiring a smaller one. For example, if it's two large companies, they both typically have their own cultures, their own systems, their own processes, right? Whereas if it's one large company acquiring a smaller company, the smaller company probably doesn't have as much of a culture. It probably doesn't have as much ingrained systems and processes. So what happens is that larger company just absorbs the smaller company and the smaller company just goes on to whatever systems, whatever culture, whatever processes the larger company has. So it's fairly straightforward. But with a merger, it's actually really tricky because you know, how do you get two very large companies with different cultures, different systems, different processes to come in, like which, like which system do you take from company A? Which system do you take from company B? Which culture do you take from company A? Which culture do you take from company B? There's thousands of questions like these, right? So it's actually a really difficult process. Um, so this video is really gonna focus on mergers and explaining kind of what the process is for integrating them in a situation like that. What are the issues? What are the learnings, etc. Now, I guess the other point, and this is point three on this chart here, is we're mainly gonna be talking about post day one integration. So this is essentially talking about a situation where we're acquiring two companies of similar sizes, we're merging them together, and we're doing it relatively soon after we've acquired them. So the other option is, and, and some companies do this, including private equity, is they'll buy two businesses, but they won't actually integrate them immediately after acquisition. Rather, they'll hold them for a significant period of time and allow them just to get used to the acquisition, and then gradually will ease them into it. Now, there's you know, a lot of reasons for doing it on day one because both companies are already going through a change process. Um, so if you're just adding on additional, you know, change at the same time to integrate them, um, you're kind of getting the pain out of the way early. And then you can focus on improving the businesses, you know, post-integration efforts and, and, and working towards exit if, if you're in a private equity environment um, or working towards your goal if you're in a kind of a, a company trade environment. Um, and then the final step is, now that we've brought those two businesses together, let's get value from them. And you know, there's many different examples of that, but for example, maybe there's duplicate people. We've got two finance teams. Maybe we merge them together and you don't need you know, the same kind of financial control or the same CFO. You only need one, so there's some savings there. Maybe there's duplicate systems, so we're playing, paying for two licenses across two different companies. Let's just get one license and we save 50 or 100 grand a year. Um, now do that. Or, or maybe kind of COGS procurement, maybe because you've got increased scale of the combined business, you can now negotiate better savings across the group. You know, there's hundreds of these different examples of, of ways you can save value. And these are called synergies. Um, and a lot of investment banks and private equity use them to justify paying a higher price on a business because they know when they merge them or, or when you acquire a business, you can then get that benefit and increase your EBITDA or profit later on down the track. So by getting that integration out of the way, you can then focus on later on, on just getting those value extraction. Whereas if you did a later integration, um, you know you, you wouldn't be able to get those value or maybe the value only appears closer to the exit period. So there's a lot of benefit to doing this day one integration. 
Okay, so let's start with some opening thoughts about integration. So I mentioned on the last slide that integration is a really simple concept, right? It's really just bringing two companies together, really easy to understand and merge them. You merge the system, the people, the processes, everything. But it's also incredibly complicated because for a couple of reasons. Number one, I think it's really often misunderstood or people don't really have a good understanding about it. And why is this? Okay, so number one, you know, many of us studying this program come from professional advisory backgrounds. So whether you're a lawyer, whether you've come from big four, whether you come from, you know, bulge back in investment banking, private equity, um, you know, management consulting, these are advisory backgrounds. These aren't people who are involved in the company that's acquiring them. We're really just advising people on acquisition. So often our involvement in a deal really just ends at completion. So when the deal is settled. Um, whereas if you're in a corporate environment, if you're working in a company, you have to deal with all the way up in the future, you know, not just ending at settlement, but you know, in the future as well. And I think because of that, because of a lot of us coming from that professional advisory background, we're stepping off the deal. We're not really seeing that integration process and we're not really seeing where things can go wrong. For example, as investment bankers, you know, we might be factoring in Oh, you can get this synergy if you get rid of this person and you might be getting this synergy if you, you know, negotiate this. But we're not there to hold their hands. We're not there to see where it goes wrong, where culture becomes a big issue, where, you know, we all these costs come up that we didn't realize and outweigh it. So that's one aspect. But, you know, in a PE or trade acquisition environment, understanding integration is incredibly important and you do get that, you know, better experience. But, you know, most of us don't come from that background. And I think the other reason why M&A integration is, you know, not really understood properly is because there's so many aspects to it. You know, it's more of a, it's not really a quantitative thing that you can just define and like in, in an acquisition, you can say the EBITDA is this, the multiple is this, the enterprise value is this, therefore the purchase price is this. It's pretty straightforward. Whereas with an integration, there's thousands of aspects to it, all the way to the smallest detail to the biggest bit detail. There's culture, there's technology, there's teams, there's processes, there's systems, there's strategy, right? You could go all day and talk about all of these different things. Um, and there's so many different areas where it could go wrong, where it could go right, and it could be different for each, div each individual company. For example, you've got a situation where two companies have completely different cultures, and you've got another scenario where you've got companies with two identical cultures. So, you know, there's so many different variables that you know, no two acquisition integrations are the same, but it also just really makes it really difficult to understand and strategize. So hence why we've putting together this training course on integration so that you can kind of come in with a better understanding and it'll make you a better advisor because A, you'll understand what the other side will look like and you can plan ahead for that. And B, if you're going into a trade or acquisition environment where you actually have to deal with integrations, you'll be one of the few people with experience and understanding of how to do a day one integration. Okay, so let's cover some of the other opening thoughts for this video. So secondly, um, you know, organizations often put in a lot of effort about the acquisition side, the M&A piece. They're thinking about how much can I pay? What savings can I get? What multiple can I negotiate? How can I get EBITDA down? Basically just reduce the acquisition price. And then you get to completion and you're like, yes, you go out and celebrate, you have drinks. But then you actually realize, oh, wait, I actually have to bring these businesses together. But often this thinking actually doesn't transpire until it's often too late. So this is another reason why um, integrations are often not done very well. And this leads me on to the third opening point, which is there's a statistic that floats around there, which seems unreal, but it is real, is that it's often cited that over 80% of m and integrations fail. Now it's hard to define what fail means, but you know this tells you that because of the points above that we discussed earlier, that integrations is an area that people do really badly in general, and you know that's because a we don't have experience, and b people don't really understand it, and c they don't really plan for it very well. So sub point to that is the number one reason for M and A integrations failing is cultural reasons, and again going back to my earlier comments about understanding and, and the qualitative nature of integrations that, you know, cultural is so hard to define. 
right? But it's our biggest cause of failure. So we need to be adept at the qualitative and the quantitative side. So this video is really trying to get you to understand that and hopefully improve your thinking and experience around that qualitative side as well. So just to conclude opening thoughts, you know, what is this training about? It's not really to provide a granular checklist of you need to do this, 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 and this for an integration because every integration is different and you can really do that yourself depending on the deal. You just got to think about it logically and be a like a process manager. But really the important skill to learn from this training about M&A integration is really that higher level thinking because, because integration is such a complex and quali uh, sorry qualitative subject, there's no point learning a process. Rather, what you should be learning is conceptual thinking, understanding what is integration, where it can go wrong, when is the right time to think about it, and lessons from kind of previous integration so that you can then apply that to your own situation. So a lot of this training is going to be focusing on a very large acquisition and day one integration that I myself led. And there's a lot of learnings from this. So let's give you the background and, and the context before we get started. So this was at a company that I worked for called Vet Partners. And Vet Partners was a acquirer and consolidator of veterinary clinics in Australia and New Zealand. So your kind of GP vets essentially buying them, consolidating them up, having a support office and really kind of growing profitability at the clinic level, providing support at the office so that the vets can focus on patient care and not having to do admin and payroll, et cetera, but also getting that multiple arbitrage as we kind of became a very large group, suddenly financial markets could access our, our business and we're willing to pay you know, large multiples. So we could buy a vet clinic for six times, for example, but you know, by the time the group had 100, 200 clinics, it might be worth 20 times. So you're getting all these different areas of growth on EBITDA, on arbitrage, the use of debt, and then synergies in all these different areas. So that, that was essentially the business model of vet partners. So in terms of the market for similar companies like this at the time, there was really only three companies. So there was there was a company called Green Cross, which was the largest at the time, and that had about 200 veterinary clinics. However, Green Cross wasn't very acquisitive. They were mainly focusing on their retail side, which was a business business called Pet Barn. So they were like your stores where you go in and buy pet beds and you know pet drugs and pet food and things like that. And they weren't really focusing on the vet side, but they did have a lot of vet clinics. So they weren't really an issue for us. But there was one other main competitor in the market, and this was called NVC. So NVC was publicly listed, so it was on the stock market, the ASX, and it had about 95 clinics or about 100 business units. So they had a couple of other side businesses like a buying group and a few other things like that, training schools. So each of these, so Green Cross had about 6.6% of the market, Vet Partners at the time had about 5% of the market, and NVC had about 3% of the market. And as we came up on acquisitions, um, basically, because there was only two players going in on it, we were both bidding up the multiples. So instead of a deal turning a six times, we might be paying six and a half or seven times, or we might be losing out on acquisition altogether because they decided to go with NVC for whatever reason. So it was proposed by myself and, and the CEO at the time of Vet Partners to why don't we put an offer forward for NVC? We didn't need to worry about Green Cross, but what if we were theoretically able to acquire NVC and merge the two together? This would bring a, a combined group of about 240 clinics or about 8% of the market and create an industry leader in the market. And the strategy for this was number one, it was transform the local acquisition market. So if Green Cross wasn't competing, it would just be the combined vet partners in VC. We'd be able to acquire clinics very quickly, probably at good multiples. And it would create a new market leader in Australia and New Zealand. And this would bring a whole lot of benefits. Additional scale means that we could invest in new, diff new areas of the business like strategy managers. It meant that we could apply some of the systems and processes that NVC had, like their wellness plan, which vet partners didn't have, um, and some other processes and systems, as well as... Um, 
That combined scale basically allowed us to negotiate additional rebates, thereby improving our COGS margin across the combined group, which we wouldn't be able to do as a standalone business. So we'll go through a bit more of these on the next, on the next page. But what were the key challenges of this theoretical acquisition and merger? So number one, I mentioned before that NVC was a listed company, so we would have to do a public to private. And this brings its own execution complexities as well as confidentiality risk because there's always that risk of insider trading if people realize, because you have to pay a premium on a public to private, otherwise shareholders, they wouldn't approve such a thing. So you have to be really careful about that, otherwise people will find out and then suddenly they'll want to buy NVC shares and bid that up. And this is all retrospective, so we don't need to worry about um, you know, insider trading now because it's all delisted, but yeah, at the time, you know, we need to be super careful about no one finding out about this. It was really only myself and, and the CEO at the time who was managing this acquisition. Second was cultural differences. So because NVC was a listed company, it had a lot of discipline in the business, and that meant there was a lot of KPIs, there was a lot of processes, the support office were really efficient. They were really, um, they had good rigor and, and various other things. So they might sound good from an outsider perspective, but if you understand the nuances of the veterinary market, you'll understand that vets, they're not in it for the money because it's a very low paying job. Um, and they're also very sensitive people. They're very caring and emotional, but there's also a very strong anti-corporate sentiment. And Green Cross experienced this because they came in previously listed company, they implemented VETS, um, KPIs, um, controls, processes, rebranded clinics, and all of a sudden people found out that Green Cross had this really bad reputation in the market and no one wanted to sell to them and no one wanted to work for them and their VET business really struggled. So we were really conscious about integrating these two businesses which were really different. So VET Partners was more laissez-faire, it was more laid back because we understood that if we approach this the right way, and tried to be really friendly and the least corporate player in the market, that vets would really respond to that, they would want to work for us, the owners would want to sell to us, you know, and this would be better for long term for the group. So, you know, we were really worried about that reputational impact, about people thinking that we were becoming too corporate. We were worried about the staff who were, were used to working on a really disciplined approach. Would they be able to adapt to this new culture under vet partners? Should we be taking and then again, you know, there are some benefits to having discipline, right? You're a more efficient company. Vet partners definitely had wage costs blowing out because we weren't disciplined around how we approached that. So, you know, there was definitely elements of maybe we should take some of the best parts of both cultures and put them together. But so, you know, but it was a key challenge, definitely. Thinking about how do we approach this? What are the issues? You know, are we going to ruin our reputation, etc.? The next issue was the combined business is a next level scale business. All of a sudden, and Vet Partners started off with you know, 20, 30 clinics, it would now be at 200 or 10, 10 times or more growth. When you're a business of that size, which is you know, 500 mil annualized revenue, 100 mil annualized EBITDA, it's a whole different ball game. You need, often with businesses as they kind of go through that first stage of life, it's a different team, both at the executive level in terms of who can manage a business at that scale but also the staff and the structure of the business and the layout of the organization. Sometimes you need a completely different structure and approach and management team for those different life, stage, life stages of the business. Businesses often get many decades to get there and, and work through that transition, but this acquisition would get us there in one day. So we had to think about that and, and how the staff would be appropriately structured and, and who would be leading the business and how those kind of different levels of management all the way down to the bottom of the organization would be structured and staffed. Did we need to make people redundant? Did we need to restructure the business? The board of the business, were they gonna think about our current CEO? Would he be able to you know, run this huge business? And finally, point four around this is that the CEO of NVC, it was understood that he wouldn't come across as part of this acquisition um, especially when myself and the CEO of Vet Partners were driving this acquisition, the CEO of Vet Partners isn't going to say, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to bring on across the next CEO and kick myself out. That doesn't make sense, right? So all of this fitted into the idea that the CEO leave, would leave NBC. But we also understood that there was a lot of X factor and loyalty linked to that outgoing CEO. 
We understood that he had a large contribution to the business, both in terms of bringing on staff, bringing on new business, bringing on acquisition pipeline, driving efficiency. And, you know, we were worried that a existing staff at NVC might leave the business. We were also worried that, um, you know, maybe we would buy this business at this EBITDA level, at this efficiency level, we'd buy it, and then we'd lose all that because a lot of it was linked to the CEO. So those were the kind of the key challenges that we had to consider as part of the integration. Okay, so these were the, this was, we, we touched on this, but this is in more detail. This was the rationale for dealing the deal. So number one, we would be able to reduce the corporate overhead of, of the combined business. And this is because there was duplicate staff, there was duplicate support, support team, there was duplicate systems. So this would allow for synergies with, which would then boost our combined EBITDA or, or profitability of our of VET partners. Number two is arbitrage at scale. So as we discussed in other videos talking about comps, is that we know that there's a very strong correlation between the size of the group and the attractive um, and the attractiveness of the group and therefore the comparable multiple that you can use on the group. So this would allow us access to another 100 sites, another 25 mil of EBITDA, or close to 100 mil of revenue, which would then bring us to that next level of comps, which would then be applied to all of the EBITDA or VET Partners Group, which would of course add a huge amount of value to shareholders. Third is the ability to leverage buying power. <clears throat> so we did some research and we established that we would probably be able to negotiate an extra $1.5 million to $2 million Australian of additional COGS rebate. And this is because, number one, there were certain terms on cost of goods sold, this is on drugs and materials, things like that, that NBC had negotiated that were much better than our terms that we could apply to our group and vice versa. There were certain terms that we had negotiated that we could apply that NBC didn't have that we could apply to theirs. And secondly, because of the way that um, wholesaler negotiation works is that typically the larger the group, the more buying power you have with suppliers, which means you can actually negotiate better rates across the whole group. And we did this analysis and we thought that we actually saved 1.5 million, ended up being about 2 million a year of savings across the group. And this was just free synergy benefit, which flew to us post acquisition. Number four, barriers to entry. So would this eliminate key market entry point for overseas local trade, private equity buyer? What does this mean? So it basically means that if someone wanted to get into the veterinary market in Australia, for example, a private equity firm that could be a KKR, could be a EQT, could be you know, anyone, or it could be a trade buyer or, or a large family group like a Mars, etc. All they would have to do is really just figure out who's the who are the kind of leaders in the market, which is kind of Green Cross, NVC, and Vet Partners, who we kind of went through in this previous slide over here. And all they'd have to do is buy one, and they might be willing to pay up because if they pay up, they can say, well, we know that these businesses are buying individual vet clinics for six times each. We can just basically pro forma that in and assume that we'll average down our multiple over time. So maybe they'll pay up and pay you know 20 times because they know that they can acquire 20 clinics a year at six times, and that might actually only work out to a, you know, a 10 times pro forma multiple after three years, something like that, right? But if you were to merge those two, really, these are the only entry points into the market. Everyone else is too small for those large players, or maybe they don't fit the bill, like they might be too retail focused or might have the wrong geographic fit, etc. These were really the only three options. We knew that Green Cross wasn't really an option because they had a large retail side and they were already owned by private equity and they weren't looking to split up the business. NVC was the key entry point for someone coming in or it could be vet partners, but we were already owned and we weren't looking to sell. So if we were to merge the two, all of a sudden, we didn't have to worry about someone else coming in, buying NVC and then bidding us up on, on, on new acquisitions. Secondly, acquisition rates. So we talked about this earlier, but obviously the key competitor at the time if that was being taken out, we would have free market to quickly acquire and acquire at theoretically lower multiples. Which again, is it going to be a huge benefit because we have to spend less money per acquisition and we can deploy a lot quicker, which is therefore going to increase our multiple arbitrage over time. 
Next is, okay, and this is very specific to NVC, but we noticed that they had a really good wellness plan. And wellness plan is basically, you know, customers can subscribe for this plan. You can implement it across your, all your clinics. And basically it gives you unlimited free vet consultations throughout the year, but it improves the average um, spend per pet because you get referrals into dentals and other higher acuity work. And you can also combine it with like um, your flea and dewormers, which adds additional retail and you can turn that into a SaaS business, etc. So we know that MVC did really well out of this and increased their revenue by a lot per site. We knew that clinics loved it. We tried doing this, well, our operations team tried doing this in our clinics, but couldn't quite get something off the ground. So this is just a way of getting a system and acquiring it without having to pay for it and just rolling it across our other sites, which I understand we've since done and have done really well out of it. Next is training centers. So again, this comes down to kind of the systems and processes. So NVC had these training centers, which basically was an opportunity to really improve the quality of work across the portfolio. So these clinics would come in, um, vet nurses would come in, the, the, um, the vets would come in and then we, they would host training like how to do this higher acuity surgery. And it was just, it had so many benefits because number one, you'd get more revenue because the vets would now how to know how to do better work and more efficiently. Number two, it would be a much more attractive place for vets to work and there's a massive shortage of vets. So if they know that they're going to get this training program, that they're going to get this, um, you know, career progression pathway, you all of a sudden you're this really attractive pathway to hire. Um, it improves your, your nurses' acuity to work so they can actually step up and replace some of the vets in doing some surgeries if they can do things like that. Um, and yeah, you can actually lease it out to other clinics as well and make some money there. So there was all these kind of arbit like ancillary benefits to the business as well. Um, and finally, just systems and processes. So there was a lot of different systems. For example, um, there was an accounts payable software, which we wanted to implement. There was an offshore finance team, which we wanted to expand on and apply to vet partners, which again, which provides some synergies. And these synergies weren't priced in either as well. So these are all kind of expected upsides after the fact. Okay, so let's talk about key risks and challenges identified at the time. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of benefits as to doing the acquisition, but there's also gonna be a lot of downside to potentially doing it. And we need to figure out these early so we can manage them and make the right decision. So the first one is that we knew that 16% of their sites were subscale, so a lot smaller than we would like to buy. And there's a lot of risks around this, for example, it's less appealing to attract and retain vets. They traditionally have higher proportional fixed costs, fixed costs and many of our existing recruitment difficulties um, w in placing vets were in these smaller sites. So, you know, what was our thought process around mitigating these risks? Well, number one, we thought about divesting or tucking in, which is basically just like closing it down and merging the staff with another one for these staff. The next one was sustainability of labor margins. So as we mentioned in the earlier slide, NVC we knew were very disciplined and we were worried that a lot of that kind of culture might be lost post acquisition, which would flow down to EBITDA margins of the acquired sites, which all of a sudden, you know, we're losing EBITDA versus what we paid for. So, you know, how do we mitigate this? Well, we said, well, there's all these other benefits, but you know, we're still willing to do the deal. Let's put in a buffer in our assumption of EBITDA. We'll still pay them for it, but it's just a buffer so that you know, on internal reporting, this is what we're measuring ourselves against. And if we're willing to pay a multiple on that lower EBITDA and it still works out, then let's do the deal. Third was our perception in the market and any impact on the rate of acquisition. So as we mentioned earlier, there's a very strong anti-corporate sentiment in the vet community. Um, and the risk was that people in the market would perceive, you know, all of a sudden this combined entity as too big, too corporate, and maybe absorbing some of those characteristics about NVC which would then kind of make us seem as this bad big corporate, which would mean that vets might not want to work for us and maybe vet owners might not want to sell their clinics to us. So how did we approach this? Well, we modeled returns of large capital investment on a lower arbitrage versus incremental M&A at higher arbitrage. So basically, what does that mean? Well, what is the end result return if we put a large amount of money, which is the acquisition for NVC, at a low arbitrage, what's our return? Because that's, you know, if we're buying NVC, it's basically equivalent to 100 acquisitions. Now let's then model out what it would take, and that's assuming we don't get any acquisitions after that. 
Next, let's look at what happens if we didn't do the acquisition, but we're acquiring a lot less, but with higher arbitrage. So we're buying a lot less at a lower multiple. So what is it? What's the net return in those situations? So we basically looked, well, in situation one, we got a lower IRR, but in terms of dollar amount returned, we got a significantly higher amount. Um, and then the other situation was we have a much lower amount of capital invested, better returns, but it's a small amount of money. So we took this to our kind of our private equity owners and we said to them, look, these are the results. Do you want to deploy more capital and get a lower return or and risk um, or let's deploy less at a lower return and they wanted to deploy more capital. And that's what we ended up doing. And look, at the end of the day, we're probably still going to get the acquisitions, but it's just a risk. And we just need to be comfortable in that situation that that's what our private equity owners are happy with. And they were. And then finally, the big one, which is just around cultural differences in the organizations, which we covered off earlier. So obviously, MVC was more disciplined. It had more, um, more processes. There was more concentration around the CEO and maybe loyalty, and there might be a risk of staff leaving. So how do we approach this? Well, we identified all the risks. We applied an LTI, so a long-term incentive scheme, to the NVC management, which would basically encourage them to stick around. We offered transaction bonuses to their company, which were payable in installments. So basically, they had to stay around. And there was a lot of team planning as well, like you know, what would happen if this person left? What would we do with the teams? So basically like scenario analysis there. Okay, so let's talk about the learnings. Um, so we're gonna use this, this acquisition as the basis to apply what are the learnings about an acquisition because these are the key conceptual learnings that you can then apply to any major acquisition. Yes, your acquisition might be different to this, might be different size, different industry, um, but conceptually, the key things to think about are typically the same, and hopefully you can then apply these learnings to your own situation. So the first learning is to really start integration planning as early as possible. So there's no such thing as over planning. So the common issues around integration is that planning usually doesn't start in many deals until the deal is nearing completion. Um, and it's not always fully appreciated what planning is actually required and the effort to do that and you know go to that granular level of detail that is needed until you get to that point and you're like oh wow i actually don't have enough time to do this in detail and consult with teams etc so the devil can often be in the detail and sometimes tasks are not planned out in sufficient detail so for example you know you're just planning okay we're just going to bring these teams together well how do you actually do that right do you need to have a training session with a team? Do you need to fly them down to meet? Do you need to have a checklist that you can give to the team leader? Do you need to have a session and speak with HR about them? Have they been appropriately um, consulted in both teams? Have they got the appropriate software and system set up? Um, you know, there's all these different things that unless you actually start thinking that detail, you don't realize until you actually start doing it how many steps and issues there are. And then finally, there can be the final issue is that there can be a disconnect between the deal team's assumption and strategy versus the implementation team. And this is a key issue that you'll often come across as a an advisor because you know, you'll have certain assumptions like you might get this synergy or you'll be able to integrate these two teams or you know, this person is going to stick around and he'll be able to lead this merger of the two teams. And and what happened in reality is that the if you had consulted with the implementation team um, which is usually the operations team, or if it's a large company, they might have a dedicated integrations team. They um, might say, okay, well, if you'd consulted me, you'd know that this person isn't actually going to be there, or actually this is going to take two years, or actually this synergy might arise, but only at 50% what you thought, or and or we actually have to hire an extra integration manager in order to do this because I still need to do my normal job, and that's going to wipe out all of the benefit from the synergy. So sometimes the deal team, and again, another point there is that the deal team are often incentivized to maximize EBITDA and they're more focused on the deal, right? So um, there might be some bias in there around their assumptions versus the team who actually have to implement it. So next category is, okay, what are those common issues and, and how did that kind of arise in the NBC um, case study that, we, that I talked to you through earlier? Well, the first issue was that because it was at public to private, we had a very lean deal team. So it was really only myself and the CEO, and I was doing the bulk of the, you know, 
uh, the, the effort, really. Um, and that meant limited resources for planning. So we couldn't necessarily go and hire a full team to do this because we wanted to keep people out of the loop. Um, so it meant limited resources for planning, essentially. The other um, issue was that focus was on really getting that deal settled until it wasn't. In other words, you know, we wanted to get that deal completed. We had to negotiate all the contracts, all the terms. There was, like, there was a lot of work on that side. And that was really the key focus when really I think we should have also be paying more attention to let's start thinking about that integration plan as early as possible whilst we're negotiating the deal. And finally, the lack of access to the target team, so target is the NVC in this case, the, the company that we're acquiring, meant that um, planning needed to be done without knowing enough about the target's people, etc. And partially this is a function of it being a public to private, but ideally in, an, in, an, in a merger, you'll be able to consult as much as possible and, and not skip this step, but you know, not, don't just do this internally <clears throat> with your operations team, with your management, do it with the other company as well, because otherwise they're going to feel left out and you're not going to really understand the key issues and the personalities and the culture unless you're actually doing them with them in the room and, and them consulted. But appreciate that probably wasn't possible with this deal, um, given it was a public to private. So then the final category is, you know, thinking about that, the common issues and how it applied to the case study, what are the learnings that you can then apply to your own post-merger integration? So the first one is, let's plan as early as possible, preferably as soon as a DD. So, you know, again, going back to that common issue where people don't start planning until it's completed, but at that point it's too late because you're gonna have to integrate pretty much ASAP. Really start early on. Do it at the same time as you're doing DD. So at least think about it at a high level, right? Next is plan in conjunction with the target company, not in isolation. So, you know, these, these, um, these integration plans, don't just come up and write your own list or ask your own internal team what they think. Do it with the other company in there as well because they're going to have their own thoughts and they might have a different view on some things. Next is make sure the plan is ready to execute from day one. So again, if you're not thinking about integration until completion, uh, you're only really leaving yourself a week or less until you're actually settling the deal. So it means you need to start thinking several months in advance and ready to action day one, not a week after it, not two weeks after it, not a month after it, but ready immediately to action. So that means you need to start early. Next is it's rarely possible to over plan. So, you know, you might be worried, oh, we're going into too much granular detail here on this plan. Let's, don't worry about that because what's going to happen is most people do their integration plan at a very high level without thinking about all the steps and processes and requirements needed to achieve that goal. And finally, it's common to have a 100-day plan, which is basically in the first 100 days after we acquire and integrate this business, this is what we're going to do. But this is a shortfall in thinking because many um, of the integration activities or the longer-term benefits and synergies may actually require a longer term focus. They're not going to be immediate fixes. They might be like a long term thing. And that means doing them while there is business as usual or BAU. Um, so you, it's probably a good idea to have a 100 day plan still, but also have one that's like a longer term plan whilst the business is still operating as usual. Okay, so I'm um, just conscious of time. I might cover the rest of the learnings in a part two to this video. So I'll end the video there and then head over to part two to watch the next one.